the way that you are. Ephesians chapter number two, we're going to begin reading in verse number 19. The words will be up on the screen there. Ephesians chapter number two, in verse number 19, it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And again, entitled this morning's message, Welcome Home to the Building. On Thursday nights we have been in a series of Is Church Essential? And I think we all believe and that we know that church is essential, uh, but the design of this series was to get us just to think about how really important it is to us. And of course, the three months not being able to gather here uh, hopefully uh, has been um, something that you've longed to be back here. And uh, we've, we're, we're thankful that you're here. But every story often will have beauty as well as pain. And it seems that no one can really escape either one. The problem is often that we lack the transparency required to walk through our lives honestly with people. The last three months have not been easy. COVID-19, the murder of George Floyd, vandalism, racism, masks, right? Probably one too many um, deliveries from DoorDash or Uber Eats or whatever one that you use uh, that you frequent. You know, it's, it's, it's had a lot of different emotions. There have been tears. There have been pain. There's also been immense joy during this time. The pain and sorrow of loneliness during this shelter in place would often lead to moments of tenderness in the Savior's arms. Moments of fear and frustration with having to stay in your home and wearing a mask and maybe all, all of the other things that, that, that came with this COVID in place would sometimes lead to seeing the amazing beauty of the little things that God gives us each and every day. Where he would bring a flower to just amazing bloom just right in the morning that you needed it. And then the hurt and the anger over police brutality, racism, and pure evil in some people's hearts were met with the soothing balm of the love of Jesus. Our story, the last 11 to 12 weeks, has been a story of such beauty as well as pain. And church family, can I say to you, and those that are watching online, we have missed you and we do miss you, and we're anticipating the day when we all can gather again as a church body. There is nothing like the church and the unity that Jesus Christ brings on any given Sunday. The church is unlike anything else in all of this world, and so God uses multiple images to teach the truths of it. For those of you that have been following our Thursday night, this coming Thursday we're going to look at the body of Christ. And then the following Thursday, the bride of Christ. But this morning I want to talk, and it's so fitting for it to be our first open up Sunday, is the church as the building. And my first point here this morning is the church is a building of people. It's a building of people. Now, I haven't delivered a message like this in three months, so if I'm a little bit rusty, that's okay. I've been doing it to the camera, uh, you know, and so sometimes we get like take one and take two. So uh, there's, if, if, we, if there's any mess up, it's, there's, no, there's no take two. But the church is a building of people. I want you to notice in verse 22 of our text, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so when Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 26, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he was talking about people. He wasn't talking about necessarily brick and mortar and things like that. No, he was talking about people. 
God's great purpose over all of the centuries is to gather people for himself. Here on earth, Christ gathers people in local congregations of believers that are called out to worship and to serve. We've looked at that on Thursday nights, kind of in the weeks leading up to this. And the image shows that the purpose of our Lord is that he wants to build us together. Again, how fitting with the times that we're living in. Peter, who was referred to in Matthew chapter number 26 as the little rock, uh, he, he picked up on this and he spoke to us in 1 Peter 2 verse 5, ye also are lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up the spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. But we are lively stones, he says. And so what Christ is doing is he is putting together a building that is made up of people and each of us are like a living stone. Now it's important that we understand that the building and the way that they would build structures in the New Testament era was completely different than the way we build homes and structures today. We are used to building with bricks and concrete, you know, uh, concrete, you know, just perfectly formed or wood that is of, you know, a, a proper size. And so the obvious thing about bricks and of wood and things like that is that it is all the same. They're the same shape. They're the same size. And often they will be the same color as you go out our doors, whether you came in the front or you came in the back and there's brickwork. It's all the same size. It's all the same color and, that, and so forth. But the picture here is not a building with bricks, but it's a picture with, it's a building with stones. You are lively stones is what Peter says. And so some stones come in all kinds of shapes. They come in all types of sizes and colors. They are hewn out of, a, out of a quarry. And when they come out, they're all kinds of rough edges. And the great skill is found in the master builder who begins to fit them together so that each one finds its special place within the building. Nick, if you'll bring up uh, th this picture here, this is what would be called a dry stone uh, dikes. They are, uh, they're, they're all over you know, Scotland and in areas of, uh, of Europe. I'd love, to, I'd love to see them at some point. Have any of you ever seen any of these in the Euro Europe area? Anyone, ever, a couple of you, seen some of those? They're, just, they're, they're beautiful things. They are, they're dry stones and they are built without any mortar. So nothing to kind of adhese them together, so to speak. And you see them all over Scotland and Europe. What's simply amazing is that there's no mortar, yet these walls, many of them, have been still standing since the 17th century. So they have no mortar. They're simply stones. You cannot build a dry stone wall from one shape or one size of stone. It's impossible. So the whole point is, is that the strength of the wall depends on the placing and the shapes of each individual stone. It is something like that that the Apostle Paul is telling us about here in Ephesians chapter number three, two, excuse me. What he's saying is, is that, is that we are all like these lively stones that Peter was alluding to. We are all we are all different. We all have our own individuality. And Christ uses this as he builds the church. Someone might come to our congregation and people have said this over the years. I'm not sure that, that I am like all of the people here. And my response would be that's exactly why you are needed here. Because it takes all kinds of shapes and sizes and colors, all kinds of living stones for God, the master builder, to build the building that he is putting together. 
So God created you as one of a kind. And he redeems what he created. And when he has placed you, well, what he's placed in you by creation, once it gets redeemed for the good of his church and for the glory of his son, it is on display. We'll see that later in a few weeks. If you follow us on Thursday night, I would encourage you to continue through this series online is that he will present himself a bride, which is the church. And it's beautiful and it is glorious. And only God could be the one that does such things. And so the church, it is a building of people. But let me say secondly, the church is a work in progress. It's a work in progress. It's made up of people, but it's also progressing. Look at verse 21 of our text. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. Now I want you to notice that, that, that in verse 21 as well as verse 22, these are present tense verses. It groweth, it, it, it builded. In other words, it doesn't say built, and it doesn't say that it has grown. In other words, the building rises as we are being built together. This is something that is still going on. And this is very important, especially for those who are, hear me, who are prone to discouragement. The Apostle Paul is telling us here that the church, it's simply a work in progress. And God's building, that it's not done yet. So no one should be surprised if the local church looks and feels more like a building site than a showroom. Because the church is made up of ordinary people who are in the process of sanctification. Now we know that in he, in the heavenlies we are we are sanctified, but there's a there's that there's that earthly process that you and I are becoming more and more like Christ. We are all saints and yet we still sin while we are on this process of renewal. And so there is not one of us here today that is everything she or he should be. It was Augustine who described the church as a hospital for sinners. He said that it would be very strange if people were to criticize hospitals. Those of you that serve in our hospitals that are here, thank you for these months of, of ministering to these people. But it would be very strange to criticize a hospital for having sick people. And so the whole point of the hospital is that people are there because they are sick and they've not yet recovered. So set your expectation of the church wisely. It is hard enough for two sinners to be married for a good marriage or for for any length of time. It is much harder for a hundred or even a thousand or however big the churches are that make up a good church. When we see Christ, we will be like him. But until then, we are being built up. We're, built, we're growing together unto what God desires for us to be. So if any congregation of believers you will find, there are things that are not yet done and things that are out of place. And, any, uh, and so some things need to be taken down. Other things need to be cleaned up. Many things are only rough around the edges needing to be finished, and it will be like that until Christ comes back. It is very easy for a critic and for a cynic to come into a local church and say, look at all that's not done yet. Look at all the things that that, that need to continue to be worked on. They're, They're not complete. How can Jesus be in a place like this? And the answer to that is, is that Jesus Christ is present in a church as the builder. He's building it up. Suppose you were having some work done at your house and you decide to kind of, you hire a, you hire a company to do some work. You go on vacation, you come back and it looks like nothing was done. You would realize they they weren't even here. What happened? But if you came home and there were some drop cloths and maybe were some ladders and things like that, there was maybe a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of mess on the floor, you would know that work was being done. You would anticipate coming home maybe to a little bit of chaos. 
And so we've got to be careful when we, when we think of the church. The evidence of Christ's presence in a local congregation of believers is not that everything is complete, but everything is in a process. The fact that the church often feels more like a building site than a showroom is evidence of the presence of the builder. So if you do not understand that, if you don't understand that the work of the church is a progress, then you're going to spend your entire life looking for perfection and you will be alone. No church will ever be good enough. No group of believers will ever be you know, good enough to allow them close into your life. And we will end up shunning away the very people that God wants to use to build up your life. And that brings us to our third point here this morning. And the church, in essence, the Christian, is the Lord's earthly home. It's made up of people. We're progressing in this, praise God. And it's the very home for the believer of the Lord. Look at verse number 22 again. In whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. One of the great themes that runs through the Bible story is that God is looking for a home while on earth. At Mount Sinai, God told Moses to build the tabernacle, a meeting place between God and his people. Then the Lord said something even better was going to happen. And that once they got into the promised land in Deuteronomy 12, verse number 5, it says, But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. This meeting place was now going to become a dwelling place. It was now going to become the habitation of God. And later, David, he discerned that Jerusalem was going to be that place. And that is why Solomon built the temple there. And when they dedicated the temple, what you had was the, the, the glory of the Lord filled that place with a cloud of smoke and saying that this was the place of where God was going to dwell. And all the people came and they saw visible evidence of the presence of Almighty God. And then you begin to follow the story of the temple. You begin to learn that God's people sinned and against Him in various ways. But when it came time, for King Manasseh to worship the Lord in the temple, they began. They had replaced it with astrology, and you can read that in Second Kings chapter number twenty-one. They had astrological signs; they were literally etched into the temple of God, and so the glory of the Lord departed from the temple. God withdrew His presence. The temple was eventually overrun, and God's people became exiles in another land for 70 years. Then God brought, um, then, then God brought, brought back into the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. They rebuilt the wall. They rebuilt the temple. But when they dedicated it, no presence of the Lord like they had originally. Then they began to get the word of, uh, from the prophets that they were to be looking for God as he was seeking a dwelling place. And by the end of the Old Testament, the prophets, they're, they're, they're literally looking for that day. Micah 3.1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And then one day he did come. When Jesus walked into the temple, do you remember what he found? There was money changers. He came in and he overturned the tables, the leadership of the temple. They had, they had lost the vision of what God wanted them. And then later, Jesus said this in Mark chapter number 13, verse 2. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another. That shall not be thrown down. And then, of course, in 70 A.D., it came to pass when the Romans came in, just as Jesus said that they would, and it was completely destroyed, and it's never been built yet. Okay, And so where is the meeting place of God today? John chapter 2, verse 19 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and three days I will raise it up again. 
He was not referring to the building. He was referring to himself. He was referring to his own flesh. And so do you see the significance of that? We've kind of, I've kind of really quickly taken you through a little bit of a, of a journey here of, of God's dwelling place. Jesus is saying that you have thought that there was just one place, one location in all of the earth that you could have been meeting with God. Jesus is saying, I'm here to tell you that I am the place where you meet with God. What did Jesus say? No one comes to the Father but by me. And so that is only true because Colossians 2 verse number 9 says, For in him, that's speaking of Jesus Christ, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then Jesus went on to say something extraordinary. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And so here is the New Testament promise. The Father and the Son, through the person of the Holy Spirit, will truly come to make home in you. That's the promise of the New Testament. And so that is why Paul says that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Believer, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that is what you are. If you are in Christ, this is your reality. Jesus in you. And that's why Paul could say in Galatians 2, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What was true in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament temple, has become a living reality for all believers. And that truly amazes me. So that means when believers gather, Christ is present. Why? Because you, in Christ... It, being the, it is the presence of Christ with you when you gather for worship and then you take that presence of Christ with you as you are sent out. That was earlier in our study. We gather to worship and then to serve. We are a called out assembly unto worship as well as to serve. And so the presence of Christ comes in all of that because he is in you. And so Christ, he, he makes his home here on earth. With his people. And I cannot stress enough, and I, and I have the last couple of weeks, that group is made up of every tribe, of every nation, and every tongue. And at the end of the Bible, you find the Apostle John looking out on all of the redeemed company of God's people. And with a loud voice, got brought together into the presence of the Lord, Revelation 21 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. I promise you this. You will be more at home in the presence of Christ as a believer when you're fully redeemed in heaven, when, when we have our glorified bodies, you will be more at home in heaven with Christ than any time that you have been on this planet. More than family. We love family. But I'm telling you, you're going to be more at home in heaven than you are here on this earth. And to be a part of the work that Christ is doing in the church, it's the greatest privilege this side of heaven. The building. You make up that building. Christ now dwells in you. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Everywhere you go, can I say it this way? The church goes. And you know one of the things I love about Redwood? Is I love that we're full of lively, different stones. Of all tribes, kindred, tongues. The beauty of it. And as I said on Thursday, if you... If you didn't have an opportunity, it was 18 minutes. I think if you take the five-minute uh, countdown off, I believe it was 18 minutes of my response to what's going on in the world today. 
I do not know necessarily every single policy that needs to be changed. I don't even claim to, to, to know that. But here's what I do know. I do know that the foundation for change is Jesus. And what Jesus can do is Jesus can unite because that's what he does. And he takes what we looked at, that, that wall like that, and fits it join beautifully together. So can I say, welcome home. Welcome home to the building. Yes, we are in our physical building, and it's awesome. I love seeing you out there with masks. How many of you are excited for masks? No, I know I'm just kidding. I know we don't. But I'm just glad we can gather. I've chosen to focus on the positive, not the negative. Sure, we wouldn't pick some of these things. I get it. But we got to gather together today. And we're praying for those that are still watching online, that as the days come forward and we go through different phases, and as soon as you uh, gain the just some comfort about coming, we hope that we hope that you will. Our folks are socially distant. We have just certain areas, deep cleaning after even after every bathroom use. And so, as soon as you feel comfortable, I want to encourage you to I, w- I want to encourage you to come. And so, church family, I want to I want to tell you how much I love you and even those that are watching, and we've missed you, and I'm thankful to be back here this morning. So let's have a word of prayer, and let's ask God to take this message in our hearts and for us to realize that we are the building. Then I have a few announcements after we pray. Father, I...